Written on the pages of the great book of nature lies a truth so profound that it has beckoned men and women throughout the ages to seek its wisdom. We will continue this quest and study many stories of humanity as we search for this light. On this journey, we will examine philosophy, religion, and science to uncover the hidden mysteries behind myth and legend using the symbols of universal Freemasonry. Welcome to Legends of the Craft. Welcome back to Legends of the Craft. I'm here with my co-host, Brother Axel Safari, and with my lovely wife, Brother Katie Crumsia. And today's subject is the hero's journey and its relation to the legends of Freemasonry. The hero's journey, are also, it's also called the, the monomyth, is this idea that Every story of mythology, every legend um, has a common thread, has archetypes, uh, sort of a backbone, a scaffold of how the journey accomplishes his great work. The names may be different, the faces, the actual adversaries, but really when you look at the principles behind it, it's all exactly the same. And this is a great way of looking at Freemasonry because I believe that it completely follows the hero's journey before that name was ever given to it. Um, so, Brother Axel, why don't you start us off with talking a little bit about the background, the history of this, before we get right into the hero's journey. So, the hero's journey, or the monomyth, like you said, it comes mostly from Joseph Campbell's work. That's where people have probably heard about it, either in the book, um, The Hero with the Thousand Faces, which was written by Joseph Campbell in 1949. Um, but it's actually, it's kind of like the summation of a lot of uh, psychological thought that started probably 30, 40 years before Campbell got a hold of it and really infused it with the ideas of Jung and of Eastern religions and kind of brought it all together. It basically says that there's really only one story that we tell ourselves, and it's the same journey towards uh, a greater self. Whether we disguise it with different faces or different places, like you said, we're really trying to encapsulate the same journey, which is the hero's journey. Joseph Campbell was a really interesting um, figure. He's an author, obviously. He also was an educator, a professor at Sarah, Sarah Lawrence College. Um, but what I liked about him, um, having, having read his book, actually, A Hero of a Thousand Faces, is that he really kind of outlined the perennial ph uh, philosophy of mythology. It's, this, it's a monomyth of humanity. It's all of our stories if we choose to walk that path. It's our story to, to, to have. And he, you know, educated at Columbia University, was deep in medieval literature. And this isn't just a Western take on mythology. This is a global take on all of the mythologies that exist um, throughout humanity's time. So he was very dedicated and educated on really pulling out the archetypes that underlined all the different stories and really did us a monumental favor of showing us the step-by-step -step process in which someone becomes a hero. And it's usually a nobody in some way. Uh, a nobody becomes a somebody. And I think when we look at the hero's journey, it's not that I think everyone's a nobody, but we have to come out of nothing to become something. Yeah, it was really, it was Jung's idea of the archetypes that really brought this theory together. There were, there were a few people like Otto Rank or Lord Raglan, um, these anthropologists from the early 20th century that kind of had this idea. But um, it was the idea of Jung's archetypes that Campbell kind of brought it all together to really give us a, a cohesive idea of the monomyth. In Freemasonry, this is extremely important because all the degrees, whether they're Scottish Rite, York Rite, Blue Lodge, they all follow specific heroes. And these heroes, um, they rise, they fall, you know, they have people that help them. And when you actually take all the degrees together as one huge story you find the hero's journey and the hero is you the candidate the person that has to go through the degrees you end up encountering threshold guardians you have to overcome challenges you have to learn and sometimes you're turned back but eventually you come to take a journey from west to east to the place of light and you succeed in your mission in overthrowing the darkness. Now, the darkness is not necessarily um, an actual villain in masonry. It's concepts. It's 
it's that inner shadow that we must overcome. But we find this in Freemasonry in its stories. And there's so many different stories and there's so many different heroes in which we, as the participant, reenact these, 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 these personalities. So I think it's very important as we go through this podcast today, and if you're a Freemason, you imagine your degree work and how it relates to these myths and how they're meant to show you the lights. It's meant to show you what you can become in real life. Masonry is a set of moral traumas, and these dramas help us become the heroes that we need to be for humanity. It at least gives us the opportunity to become the hero of uh, our own story. And to look at the hero's journey, we're going to look at the Joseph Campbell model, just because that's the one that seems to be more um, kind of the foundation of the models that came after. Um, Brother Axel, why don't you talk a little bit about the models before we look at the different um, sections of the hero's journey. So after Campbell kind of introduced the his 17-part uh, monomyth, a lot of people have uh, adapted it, improved it, delved deeper into certain sections, got rid of things, added certain things. So you have famous examples like David Adams Leeming, uh, Phil Cousineau, who was actually a student of Joseph Campbell, uh, Christopher Vogler, a more recent edition. But these, it's basically, it's funny that all the interpretations of the monomyth really are also kind of mono interpretations of the monomyth. There's only so much you can talk about, but people divide it in different ways. But today we're going to focus on Joseph Campbell's model, which is divided into three portions. The first portion is the departure. So it's the call to adventure, the refusal of the call, supernatural aid, the crossing of the first threshold, and the belly of the whale. The second section is the initiation, which starts off with the road of trials, the meeting with the goddess, women as the temptress, my favorite, uh, atonement with the father, apotheosis, and the ultimate boon. And the third part is called the return, and that's the refusal of the return, the magic flight, rescue from without, the crossing of the return threshold, master of two worlds, and finally, freedom to live. Now, the interesting thing about the uh, variations that came after Campbell is they, they kind of made it a little bit more um, chewable because 17 steps is a lot to remember. So the the thing I like about Campbell is he's much more intricate and detailed, but I think that can also be very overwhelming. Um, there's a couple of those variations out there that just really kind of make it a lot less um, specific. But I do like that each principle that Campbell outlined is very much its own step in this process. Well, and I like that um, that level of detail too, because it kind of bridges both the religious and the secular interpretation of it. Like the religious interpretation, you probably need fewer steps in order to kind of like describe all of the religious myths. But then the the secular is is, is leaving out important kind of religious aspects of the journey. And I think Campbell's is the is the one that kind of bridges and unites both of those ideas. In Masonically speaking, there's there's a couple ways we can look at this, I think, guys. Um, the departure, the initiation, and the return could be seen as the three degrees of Freemasonry. So the uh, being entered into Freemasonry, the first degree, the ap apprentice, is the departure. The second degree, or that of fellow craft, could be the initiation. And the return is that of Master Mason. That's one way of looking at it. If we want to look at just the first degree, we can see these three parts. So the departure would be the chamber of reflection. The initiation would be the mysterious journeys uh, leading up to the obligation. And the return would be uh, the final consecration and, and receiving your apron. So I think there's two different ways. I don't know if you guys can think of any other ways that we could apply the hero's journey, at least in its simple three acts, uh, to the Blue Lodge of Freemasonry. Well, no, as you're, as you're kind of going through that, I was thinking the same thing, that each, each degree has each of these elements. There, there's kind of like this overarching um, you know, journey throughout all the degrees of masonry, but then within each degree, you have a hero's journey because each degree is the tale of, of a hero. The hero might change, their location might change, but I think every Mason listening would recognize that each degree is a hero's journey in and of itself. It, with small details changed so that you can learn particular things, but really it's the same process over and over again. So it's both like the entire ladder of masonry is a hero's journey, but each rung contains a hero's journey within it. So in the, the first part, the first section, the departure, the call to adventure, 
I particularly resonate with this one, especially as a Freemason, because the call to adventure, I always think of this question, where were you first prepared in your heart? Or first prepared to be a Freemason, and it's in your heart. And to me, that's the call of an adventure. And it's sometimes very subtle in people. Sometimes they they don't realize the seed is there. And then it starts to pull at them and they find a longing out of it that something needs to change. Something is pulling them elsewhere. And some people have a very rapid experience. And I can't say mine was rapid. Mine was more of a subtle, slow pull and departing me from my um, path that I thought I was going to go on growing up. So this departure, this call to adventure is extremely important because why would you walk off the path to do something that a lot of people would call foolish? You know, like, why would you go do that? Well, because there's something that you feel called to do. So that's the very first and most important step. Well, in, in Freemasonry, you know, one of the first questions on the catechism or exam is, where were you first prepared? And the answer is, in my heart. So I think the cult to adventure is, is the same thing in Masonry when we say that the journey begins in our heart. I think every Freemason has has experienced this. And and really, I would say the, these things kind of present themselves in everybody's life. In, in some lives, it's going to present itself as Freemasonry. In others, it might be, you know, a change of location or something like that. Because really, like, what it is, is it's the first kind of, um, you know, contact with the unknown, with chaos, with, with a world that, that is completely beyond everything that you conceive of in your day-to-day mm-hmm. life. So... However that takes its form, I think, you know, for every Freemason, Freemasonry was once this kind of chaotic, unknown thing. It represented um, a a void space on the map that had to be filled. I know you're going to be a little shocked, Brother Axel. I'm going to see it a little bit differently than you do. (laughs) Um, I I don't think the call to adventure is something as mundane as just a moving of a location. It, It can be a part of it. But the call to adventure is something that is some is interior to yourself. It's not... Uh, you know, just picking up and moving. It's something that has to be more cosmically motivating to get you to move. Because you got to think the hero's journey is not like, oh, yes, this is going to be great and easy and I'm going to get done with it in a day and it'll be over. It's it's something that's going to change where you go. And masonry, I mean, it changed my life 100%. So, you know, you have to have something there that really has a greater force to push you off the path than the force that keeps you on the path. Well, I think some good examples of this, if we can use modern mythology, would be uh, The Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, which I think we'll end up referencing. Harry Potter. And Harry Potter as well. And The Matrix. Don't forget The Matrix. And The Matrix. (laughs) I apologize. Uh, But yeah, I mean, they're all great examples. Like the the hero, you know, uh, Frodo Baggins, Luke Skywalker, they get a call to adventure. For Frodo, it's the showing up of Gandalf. Uh, the gray, the wizard shows up in, in Hobbiton and, and basically calls him to adventure. And for Luke Skywalker, it's R2-D2 and 3PO showing up with a message from Princess Leia calling him to an adventure. And I think in The Matrix, it's... it's follow the White Rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. The and White Harry Rabbit. Potter, he literally receives a summons. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's like, it's not that hard to conceive of this in our own life. I think there's these periods where, you know... It could be like getting the opportunity to take a job in China or, you know, you meet somebody and they're like, let's go off to Europe for three months. I mean, it it can be that simple, but it's something that drastically changes your life. And and, and I think leading into the second point here, it gives you a moment of pause. Like, should I do this? Because it's going to change everything. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also I think it, it, it always comes in the form of. A relatively minor change in one's day to day life, the the implications of which can't be seen by the protagonist in the story, which is why this I think the second stage happens, the refusal of the call. I think if the uh, if if the um, the great things that would happen to the hero were apparent at the very beginning, then they wouldn't have to refuse the call. But every hero refuses their kind of higher calling at first because there's still this like this weight from the old world this weight of of comfort and of the known that's kind of clinging on to the feet of the hero preventing them from moving forward so something more drastic has to happen in order to get them to actually move forward like when uh like in the matrix for example when neo's first trying to escape from the agents he can't take that final leap and so the agents take him and, he, you know, the story continues from there. But everyone kind of reaches that and and some part of the old world is holding them back from really moving forward. 
The, the second step of the refusal of the call, I think, is very interesting because a lot of people think, like, well, if you hesitate, you, like, all is lost. And there's a, a line in Campbell's book that says, not all who hesitate are lost. I mean, we all have those moments where we're, I think about masonry. It's like, when I was going through my initiation, I was like, what is this? What have I done? Because it's so vastly different than anything I experienced. And so there was a hesitation. But I think where we're all lost is when we don't actually push through, where Neo actually doesn't go through, or Harry Potter, or all the great uh, modern myths. We have to accept it at some point. And I think if it's really planted deep in our heart, as it says in Masonry, we really can't refuse it without feeling utter destruction within ourselves. But you can refuse it. You and can. I, I think in, in Freemasonry, this is where you approach the door of the temple and you are you're given the choice whether to move forward or to retreat. And I think, you know, in a real magical way, if you proceed forward into the unknown, and this is why I think masonry has to be real. Like people can't be laughing in lodge. Mm -hmm. They're actually, the, the, the person has to fear what could happen. Like it has to be very dramatic. It has to be very real. It has to be very solemn. It has to be very serious so that the choice is a real choice. It's not like, well, I know what's going to happen next. No, it's a real choice. And there are real dangers ahead. And if you do retreat, I think forever that sort of alters the rest of your life if you refuse the call of the journey. Well, it's uh, an example of that is for those who've read The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho, the uh, merchant who never, he refused his call and he was stuck and miserable. And I think there, there are examples along our life of people who have refused. You know, not, not everyone wants to be a hero at the end of the day, else they would choose otherwise. So it's not like you're assured that if you have a call in your heart to go do something that you're guaranteed to be the hero at the end. Well, I think it, it, even if once the first call is refused, there's a kind of like, there's a questioning doubt as to, you know, the, the completeness of one's reality that grows the longer, like the period. And, and that's why there's always like a, a second return of, of the mentor or the guide that comes along um, and brings the, the hero into the next stage is because they haven't really given up. Like you said, Brother Katie, like if that desire has taken root in your heart, it's not going anywhere anytime soon just because you, you refuse it one time. It's going to continue to bother you. It's going to continue to eat away at you. It's going to continue to bring up these questions that you might not necessarily be comfortable with that will lead you to be more perceptive to this kind of hero's journey that's devolving upon you and, and isn't going to take no for an answer. And I think this happens to every human being. I think we all can think back, and I invite you to do this as we're talking about this. Go back into your memory and think of those moments that you most regretted in life. It's probably something that you had the chance of doing something great, maybe becoming uh, an athlete, maybe going to an overseas school, or, or maybe being part of a great project, but you were kind of scared and you didn't do it. And then you live the rest of your life regretting this. So, I mean, I think our regrets is the refusal to the call. Well, and I think it's important to go to the next step, which is a supernatural aid, step three of this uh, first departure. Because a lot of people, you know, they don't necessarily believe in a higher power or whatever, but you really can't get through life without some supernatural aid. It's like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but whoever's out there listening to me, please help me at least know that I'm making the right choice. Somehow, give me a sign, nature, tell me, or God, or whoever it is. Like that supernatural aid is extremely important on those first initial steps into the hero's journey, even into masonry. Well, I, I find that very interesting because, you know, no Masonic initiation is conducted without invoking the aid of the supernatural. In all our ceremonies, the, the, the aid of the supernatural is invoked and brought down upon the neophyte for initiation so that they can be helped through this perilous journey that they're about to undertake. I think that's something that Masonry recognizes every time the lodge is open, that the, its work can only be done under the aid of the supernatural. Well, and if we, we take that idea right into our modern myths that we're using to associate these stories with, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi aids Luke Skywalker. I mean, he's a Jedi Knight, so he's he's he has he's an embodiment powers. of the supernatural. Uh, Gandalf, uh, helping Frodo, mm -hmm. he's also uh, supernatural. Morpheus, Morpheus, right? I mean, who's Morpheus? Another another point towards supernatural aid. And what do we get in Freemasonry? We are entrusted a guide, entrusted Brother Terrible, and they are to lead us through these mysterious journeys towards 
an understanding of ourself. So no matter where we go in life, I think there's always some sort of supernatural aid to assist us along the beginning of our journey. Well, that supernatural aid gives you the uh, courage that you lack. It like makes up for the courage that you don't have on your own. And that's why all of the, the myths that you brought up, the modern ones, that those people that come in to assist the hero or the hero to be, they're all benign people. They're very kind, benign protectors of destiny. That's how Campbell places it, is benign protectors of destiny. And what I love about it is when you have that supernatural age, you feel invincible. And there's a quote that Joseph Campbell puts in here with Napoleon that I love because it, again, it gives that supernatural, it gives us a courage that we would not necessarily have on our own. And this is the quote. I feel myself, said Napoleon at the opening of his Russian campaign, driven towards an end that I do not know. As soon as I shall have reached it, as soon as I shall become unnecessary, an atom will suffice to shatter me. Till then, not all the forces of mankind can do anything against me. And I do feel like having that supernatural aid, when you, you've accepted the call, you've gone through that hesitation of the refusal of the call, and then you have that supernatural aid, you do feel a sense of invincibility where you're like, no, I got this. I'm a fool, but I'm a guided fool, <laughs> if you will. Well, in the fourth stage, the crossing of the first threshold is where that fool really encounters the unknown. So usually this is like this is the point where um, the hero will jump into something that's not quite so pleasant. So they've had the call to adventure. They've refused it, but their supernatural aid has kind of coaxed them along into it. But this is kind of the first place where they will experience consequences. They've crossed the threshold into a chaotic, unknown world. They don't have solid footing underneath them anymore. And in masonry, this is the point at which the, the kind of the real initiation work begins. This is the point at which the candidate is pushed totally beyond all of their normal experiences into something that kind of can actually raise their consciousness by, you know, shattering their way through it. Well, the thing that's interesting about the crossing of the first threshold is there is uh, something, there's these entities that Campbell points out in his monomyth that they're called the threshold guardians. And there's uh, four in each direction, or one in each direction, so four there, and then one threshold guardian up and one threshold guardian down. And when I think of this in regards to a Masonic context, I think of the four elementals. So the four threshold guardians that guard the elementals as you proceed through the mysterious journeys, as well as the guardians. You have the guardians that guard before you walk in. So you are constantly having to prove yourself coming out of the chamber of reflection. Then you get to the door and then you have to, you have to prove yourself with the, the guardian and the inner door. And then you have the four elementals. So the threshold guardians are real. They're, these are our first trials and tribulations. Well, if we look at the magic flu, which I forgot the name of uh, the, the hero and the hero. Uh, I want to say. Tanino. Well, whatever their names are, you know, <laughs> uh, the main heroes they actually have to overcome four elements. And that's what allows them to be initiated uh, into the temple of truth. So, I mean, that's a very direct way of looking at it. Or we can look at, you know, we can look back to, to our modern myths again and what happens to Luke Skywalker? Um, you know, he, he refused the call to the journey. Then he goes back to uh, Uncle Owen's and Aunt Beru's place where he lives and Darth Vader's already killed them. He's now committed, right? Mm -hmm. And then he has to overcome certain obstacles to get off the planet, right? Yeah. And, th and those are the threshold guardians. Well, it's interesting because Tatooine is all Earth. It's all desert. It if begins look, with the Earth. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting way of looking at it. And if you tie threshold guardians into who you are as an individual, it's like, what things do you have to overcome inwardly in order to be able to move forward. Because to me, if you look at the mythology of masonry, they're just external examples of what you have to do internally. Like you can't fight guardians outwardly without fighting the enemy within and be successful. Well, and I think too that there there's something in it that recognizes that there's no progress that can be made if you think you have a way back. Like you're not really committed until there's no way back to the old world. And, 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 you know, it's, so, so your bridges have been burned. Behind exactly. You. Your bridges get burned behind you. So there's no way but forward. And, and in, in masonry, there are several opportunities for the neophyte to retreat. But once those opportunities are exhausted and they've expressed a will to continue, 
then there's no more opportunities. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not you're not checked in with periodically like, hey, is everything okay? Like once you cross that threshold, you're going all the way to the end. Whether you know, whether you like it or not, like you're going to go to the end. I think if we look at the four elements, you know, once you know your 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 bridge has been burned and, and we use the four elements as the threshold guardians as as archetypes, you know, it usually begins with earth. Well earth I think would be you have to overcome your own um, physical passions you know your your temptations your physical temptations your vanity of your material wealth or you know um, how you look not that you shouldn't look nice if you can but that shouldn't be the only thing that matters such type of vanities of vices well addictions uh, sen- sexual temptations I think this is all that's the uh, that's the first threshold guardian then the next one is water which I think can be the emotions it's um, when we get angry, you know, always trying to seek to be happy, our reaction to people. It's just being kind of overwhelmed by the waters, you know, being tossed to and fro with our emotional states. So we're never really physically in control. So this threshold guardian checks that we have control of our emotions. I think that's the, the point to understand is not that we're supposed to battle these, thre- these threshold guardians. It's that they're there to check to make sure we're worthy to pass. Not to fight us, and if we're not worthy, then to say, "Hey, you're 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 not passing," and without you know extreme difficulty. Then comes the threshold guardian known as air, and I think this is our mind. So this is where we trick ourselves. You know, uh, maybe we're too good, or we're not good enough. This is where we get lost in our own thoughts. Where probably we're over analyzing everything. We think everybody's looking at us. Everybody's talking behind our backs. And we create these entire stories in our head of of things that are happening that we're very upset narratives. about. These mm-hmm. narratives, but they're not true. It's just these are these are mental ghosts. constructs. Yeah. yeah, they're constructs to overcome. And then finally, I think the the fourth threshold guardian is uh, fire. And this one sound, this I think is a harder one to dissect a little bit. But I think this is. That we're not so overzealous, that we're not fanatics, that we don't burn ourselves out. Um, so like a that vigor? Well, it's self-righteousness, you mm-hmm. know? I think it's also, uh, it's the spiritual test. It's the, fi- it's, it's, you know, really testing whether or not you want to get beyond yourself. It's that final gateway into, into something higher than the individual or something higher than the individual consciousness is the gate of fire. It's burning away those last, like personal vestiges of of the self that that stand in the way of something higher i'm not saying that the self is necessarily evil or that the ego needs to be killed or anything like that but that there are it's the last kind of attachments to oneself and oneself involvement that have to be burned away that's probably the most painful trial Mm -hmm. to undergo so i have a question before we get to the final step of uh, the departure Uh, my question is if so we went through the the four elementals and how they relate to the human being what do you guys think the guardians represent of the up and down in Campbell's monomyth and how I put it as the inner and outer guard? Um, do you, what would you say those threshold guardians are trying to do? And I don't know if you want to look at it more of a Masonic perspective or the Campbell perspective of guardians of up and down. Well, I think whether from a monomyth perspective or a Masonic perspective, I think the threshold guardians serve to orient the hero to the new world. Like they're 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 the the new cardinal directions that they have to navigate by because these trials, you know, especially masonically speaking, are are going to form the kind of foundation of the terrain that you're now on. Like you know, whether it's confronting the bodily vices or giving up the emotions, like these are things that are going to orient you and what you do from now on. So I, I think they serve, especially with the up and down elements added. I think they serve to orient you in the new world that you have to explore and become a master of. Well, and I think. The up and down could refer to, uh, it, you know, as simple as that, you know, alchemically, when you look at the four elements, like they're literally triangles that point up and down, you know, so they're, they're ones that point us to the sky and others that point us to the ground. And I think you have to balance both of those before you can really overcome and get to the next stage, uh, the last stage of the departure, which is the belly of the whale. Brother Cadiz, why don't you tell us a little bit about this belly of the whale? It's kind of a weird name. One last thing I want to say before we get to the next step is that it's interesting that there's six guardians. And if you look at a Ashler, it's six-sided. 
and we're constantly trying to work on our rough ashlar. So we're constantly having to go up against these mm. threshold guardians all the time. It's not like you can just prove it once and you're like, oh, I'm done. Thank you. And you move on. No, you're constantly working on a different face depending on where you are in your life. And I think that's continual labor that people oftentimes might overlook. So the next step in the final part of this section is the belly of the whale. And this one's weird because it's a weird name. Um, it makes me think of Jonah and the whale, just because of his association, I suppose. But really what this is representing in Campbell's monomyth is a disappearance into the darkness. Like you're disappearing into the unknown. Like you are literally engulfed and have no way of getting out and you don't know where you are. I think this represents the part of the, the hero's journey when they're finally kind of on their own. They've been pulled out of their normal world, but they're still kind of clinging to um, the mentor, you know, from the third stage. There is some kind of like anchoring element to this that they they have somebody that they can rely on. I think this is the first point in a hero's journey when they have nothing. You know, they, there's a point in every Masonic initiation that every Mason listening to this will be familiar with where you can only move forward on your own. Right. And it's that point at which you have to take what limited knowledge you have of this new world up to this point and kind of mix it with your own intuition to actually, you know, cross the bridge that you can't even see to walk over. To look at it in a parallel well, because, you know, the beauty about Masonic symbolism is not one way to look at it. All the previous stages we discussed may be something that that occurs before you even get to the lodge. Mm -hmm. It's just it's it's wanting to become a mason it's overcoming the interviews it's sorting out your desire to move forward and finally lo- knocking on the door of the temple and the belly of the beast is the chamber of the ref- it's of not reflection. belly of the beast it's, it's, <laughs> oh sorry belly of the beast. it's the same thing <laughs> belly of the beast belly of the whale i like belly of the beast but this is where you you go into the chamber mm-hmm. it's a cave you know what what is the belly the belly is a, is a dark place mm-hmm. it's a cave this is you know um if you think of Star Wars, this is the Empire Strikes Back where, you know, on Hoth, they're they're in a cave underground. Or they go into that, an actual asteroid where it's like a, I think it's some sort of like worm creature in an it's asteroid. It's like a space, it's the belly of the space whale. Exactly. Yeah, it's a space whale, exactly. <laughs> uh, he literally took that from there. So I think, you know, again, there's not one way of looking at this, but we could be, we could slow this down where we haven't even gotten to the chamber of reflection. Or this is, like you said, this part where, you know, you're on your own. And, you know, there's no one to help you and, and you're isolated by you know, yourself. But the positive part of this is that it, it it's also the lowest point at which, you know, like it's from here that the hero begins to work back towards this kind of higher state of being. A third interpretation to that is that the belly, the belly of a whale is the temple itself. Mm-hmm. I like that, too. So going in and, and experiencing this thing that you, like, as Brother Axel, you, I believe it was you, were saying that you have a lot of times to say, yeah, you know, I'm good. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then there's a point where it's like you've committed and you're going to go forward. And that's really the disappearing into the unknown because there's no way to come back. Because even if you try to come back, you'll come back completely changed. You're not going to come back the way you hmm. entered. So there's that disappearance into the temple. So that's maybe a third interpretation. So we, we're done with the departure, which is Act 1 of the hero's journey. And now we enter Act 2, which is initiation. And the first part of initiation is the road of trials. And I think we could easily associate this in the second degree with those stages that you kind of have to move through in which you learn to become an actual mason. Mm-hmm. You know, like the initiation is just to get you into the, into the door of the temple. But really it's in the second degree which I think people spend way too little time in, frankly, where you really learn the, 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 the craft of masonry. This is really where you unravel the seven liberal arts. This is where you become a mason. This is, you, you have to put in all your work here. Mm-hmm. The initiation is to get you into the door, and that's sort of the departure from the old world to the new world, but it's here in, in you know, the initiation of the second degree that we really become Masons through education, through trials. Well, it's not like just being introduced to a new world isn't enough to make you heroic. Like plenty of people can be drag kicking and screaming into a new world, but that doesn't mean that they can actually do anything good with the changes that are going to happen to them. I think this is the part where the hero actually starts becoming a hero. 
And that does, like, in the second degree, that requires, like, getting some skills, like, figuring out how to move around in this new world, figuring out how to actually accomplish the things that would have seemed impossible to you before. Just in the same way as, like, in the second degree, like, you are being educated in the ways of being a Mason. You're not really a mm -hmm. Mason yet. This is, this is your training stage. And, and it's the same in all of these mythological stories. There has to be a period of education and instruction that the hero goes under so that they can become a competent hero later in the story when they're actually needed. Well, and the thing that's interesting about this that Campbell ties uh, to the Road of Trials, that first step into initiation, he calls this place a dream landscape of curiously fluid, ambiguous forms. And it's here where we have to purify our senses so we can learn how to fight these these trials that are coming in great succession. And I think, um, you know, Brother Matisse, you're, you're very right. A lot of people do not spend enough time in the fellow craft degree because they're so anxious to become a master mason. But as I've always said, if you want to learn how to be a great master mason, you have to learn how to be a fellow craft first. And that's because you're equipped with so many different tools, not just logic and rhetoric and looking at how number moves through space and time. It's also learning about the mysteries of the universe and how you fit into the grand mythology mm -hmm. um, as a part and, and, and person of it all. So it's a dreamscape. And when I think of Mason, that was probably the best way that I could picture when I first got initiated. It's like, this place is outside of my understanding and time. These, these are very interesting. And it's very, um, you know, things like the, the the tracing board. Like, you look at it, it's like just scattered. You're like, what does that even mean? There's no, it's not, it's not connected. That's what I'm looking for. It's not connected. It's not cognizant to me. It's very fluid. Well, Brother Katie, you really brought to mind this idea of the fellow craft and the, you know, further this idea of you need to spend a lot of time there is that if you look at the ancient mystery schools, if we go to Cortona to the school of Pythagoras, you spent five years in that school working and overcoming trials that were set forth by, you know, the teachings of Pythagoras and acquiring mathematical knowledge. You spent five years, not five months, not a weekend in a stadium where you pay a bunch of dues and get all these degrees quickly like the Mailcraft Masons doing. No, you spent five years because this is something that's real. And I think, you know, in movies they go by quickly, but you know, really when you when you if we were to flush out a lot of these movies or these stories in the story, they're taking years. You know, it's mm -hmm. we're watching them in three hours, but mm -hmm. you know, I know the story of the Lord of the Rings takes place over thirteen months. Yeah. Well, I think Brother Katie made an interesting point, too, that this is also the stage at which you acquire a new mythology. You acquire a new context to your being. Like, this is where, uh, you know, Neo learns about the, the war with the machines and what happened mm -hmm. to humanity after you paradigm. You know, Harry Potter starts to learn about his parents and their part in the magical war with Voldemort. Like, you start to kind of, like, recontextualize yourself. And I think that's that's the same thing that happens in Masonry in the second degree is that you, you begin to contextualize yourself within the story of Masonry. You, you knit yourself into the new world. And, and you kind of, like, you, you get a new understanding of how it is that you became to be the person that you are within this new world. Well, and that ties really nice into the next step of this initiation is the, the meeting with the goddess. And I think this is very convoluted up front because you're like, oh, you know, what does that mean? Meeting with the goddess. The goddess in mythology for Campbell represented um, what was the totality of what could be known. So she, the, the goddess, represented what could be known. And the neophyte or the mason or the hero was the one who came to know what she had to teach. So this was kind of, it's not the alchemical marriage, but there is a part of blending where there's that um, submission and saying, you know, I'm not that great of, you know, in the grand scheme of things. I'm, I'm just one person. I just want to know. My glass is half filled. I've come to fill it. What do you, mother goddess, have to show me? And I, I think it's a real travesty that we don't really see a lot of that in a lot of mythologies where you have that feminine aspect. And it's not because, you know, it's all about women. It's about really that Carl Jungian idea of blending the anima and the animus together, the known with the unknown. Well, I think, you know, what you're saying, Brother Katie, made me think of the first three cards of the uh, of the tarot arcana. Is you have the fool, the hero, right? The, this person that's wandering off a cliff into the unknown. They meet the magician, the source of supernatural aid. And then the next character that they meet is the empress, who is kind of like she holds the scroll of the law in her hand. She she is Isis. She's the, the totality of everything that can be known, like you said. And that it's interesting that you have to meet one and then the other. Mm -hmm.
And if I could, uh, Brother Matisse, I know you wanted to say something, but Campbell puts it really beautifully about the, the goddess. He said, um, as the hero progresses in the slow initiation, which is life, the form of the goddess undergoes for him a series of transfigurations. He can never be greater than himself, though she can always promise more than he is yet capable of comprehending. That doesn't sound like knowledge, right? She lures, she guides, she bids him burst his fetters. And if he can match her import, the two, the knower and the known, will be released from every limitation. I mean, that to me is like the greatest story. Well, in the second degree, I, I don't want to give too many details, but I think this is, you know, following all these these stages that we go through in, in life, in masonry, we get to this point where, you know, we we kind of look upwards and, and we bask in the glory of the divine, you know? And I think this moment in the ritual is where we connect with the goddess. Well, hopefully we connect with the goddess, right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, all possibilities are unleashed at that moment. Well, and when you look at this interaction of the goddess and the hero, this represents how the hero, once, once it's figured it out, how he's accepted that feminine um, knowledge of the totality of anything that can be known is the mastery of life, which I don't know anyone who's mastered life, but that's why I think going again, back to that point, like spending time in the fellow craft degree is so important because you're learning the tools to learn more information. You're not going to become necessarily reliant on other people's authority to tell you what to believe that you can actually look at knowledge and letter and half it with knowledge and see where it takes you. And you become a master of your own destiny by having that interaction with, with the goddess. Well, in the French, right, this is the point where you find the letter G. You know, this is where you find geometry, gravity, gnosis, and God. You know, these, the, the, the letter G, I think, is the goddess. And you know what? It's the same, it starts with the same letter, right? Mm -hmm. G for goddess. So I think it's very interesting that it, that correlates almost perfectly. Maybe a coincidence? Probably not. Well, and you can think of it, too, as the, the neophyte in the, in the fellow craft degree is, is the knower mm -hmm. and the goddess is life. So how do you get to know life? You have to be a craftsman in mm -hmm. that to really, truly embrace what it means. Well, and then kind of the, the you know, monomyth interpretation of it, too. Like, the hero has to live two lives. So this is the point at which you have to catch up to a new life that you haven't been living. Just like in the in the second degree, we're describing an educational period in, in life. So it's like it's condensing, you know, the first part of a second life so that you can get caught up to where you need to be. Now, this leads to the second, or what is this, the seventh step we're on? It's the third of the second the act. The third of the second act. <laughs> um, so this is woman as temptress. So this is the point at which the hero encounters temptation for the first time. Have, after having just met with truth, having encountered truth, so now the hero is starting to feel sure of themselves, that they have acquired some secret knowledge, and now that knowledge is going to be put to the test, whether or not they can continue on towards their higher calling, towards this kind of like decisive moment in their lives where they have to be victorious for themselves and for others. This is the, the first obstacle in that path. Now, it's woman as the temptress. That doesn't mean that women are bad and that they're always tempting men away from their higher calling. That's not what's meant by this. Woman as temptress is more of a symbol of um, earth and of life being a temptation to the hero who must um, sacrifice things in order to get to this higher place that they don't really even understand yet. So the temptations of life are to live comfortably, are to, you know, um, kind of be content with the knowledge that one has and to not put oneself through any more pain. But that's exactly what has to be surmounted if, if a person is going to become a hero. Well, and I think it's really important because there's still some people I know who are stuck that are like, oh, women are always evil. No, we're just delicious. And that makes us very <laughs> tempting and it's okay. You know, it's like when we look at women as a temptress, we're looking at how life can be seductive and how if you look in alchemy, you have that fourth stage where, you know, it's kind of dubbed the peacock stage because you tend to think you have it all. You have the philosopher's stone and you're done on your grand search. You are the hero. You're the master of life. And that's when the goddess transforms into the temptress. And it's not something ugly or banal. It's just that we have to be careful that if we're not constantly working on those threshold guardians, we're going to slip back in to the profane soup. And we're not going to be on our path anymore. So it's really an interesting 
analogy to what, or it's probably a metaphor, it's an interesting metaphor to what really tempts us. Are you in love with your mind? Are you in love with your knowledge, your your self-righteousness? I mean, what are the things that tempt us so much that would make us think that we've, we've made it and not have us progress forward? So in mythology, this would be analogous to, um, you know, Calypso tempting Odysseus to stay on the island rather than continuing on on his journey. It's, it's this kind of um, this call to stay where you are and not progress any further because, you know, you've enlarged your sphere of action. And so the woman as temptress emerges to say, oh, that's good enough. That's good enough for me, so why? So it should be good enough for you. You don't have any need to go any further. Well, and if you look at modern mythology with, uh, you know, Star Wars, that weird part where Leia tempts Luke and, and, like, no one talks about it. I think, you know, George Lucas, who was greatly influenced by Campbell, really saw this point where it's like, yeah, he didn't know it was his sister or whatever. That's not a big point. It's the fact that he was tempted for a moment by what Leia represented, not Leia as a person. And so you'll see it in also modern mythology as well. I think this point in, in, in the fellow craft journey, uh, kind of what you said, Brother Axel, about it being the, the peacock face. Um, you know, if you look at fellow crafts, uh, they tend to get real cocky at this point. You know? <laughs> we like to tell everyone and, what and, to and do. You, in, in, you have to look at assistant Macy where it actually takes you time to move through the degrees. Obviously, if you're a fellow craft for like a day... <laughs> Or a month, yeah. you don't experience this. You don't have time this. to get caught. Yeah. <laughs> but if you've been a fellow craft for several years, like typically most fellow crafts in our order are, um, they get real cocky. They, they, now they think, you know, they know what's going on. They can tell the apprentices what to do. And they get caught up in themselves. They're tempted by the knowledge they've gained. And they really think they're, they're, they're hot stuff. You know, they're, they're, they're studs in the order now, so to say. And that's just not the truth. And sometimes that gets them to be stuck here, you know, uh, where they almost don't progress because they think they got it all down. But really, it's just the beginning of the journey. But they're lost in their their own, uh, in, in almost in the mirror of their own reflection. Well, it's very uh, narcissists, you know, looking into the pool and staring at themselves. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, having watched a lot of brothers go through mastery and seeing brothers that have stayed in a particular degree, especially the fellow craft, they get frustrated and they don't understand why they're there and they're not willing to take feedback from those who would be the ones to guide them through. So they're really too busy staring at the, you know, the hyperbial mirror to sit there and say, well, maybe I don't have it all. And maybe these people who've been in masonry much longer and have much more knowledge and experience might have some truth to help me out of this. But there's that profound frustration that locks them into this spot, which is why it's important that they get out of this and they get into the next step, which is the atonement with the father. So the atonement with the father is an interesting idea because this is where you have that masculine principle that Campbell pulls out of all these world mythologies where you as a hero on this journey have to face that which has the ultimate power over you. And most of the time, the hero sees the father as an ogre, but the father in that ogre state is really the reflection of the hero's ego which is usually what pins people down. And you have to think about the idea if the, if the father represents the hero's ego, what does that mean to have the atonement with the father? And where do we see that in masonry where you really have to confront your ego? I think this is the middle chamber. I think this is the winding staircase. I mean, you've got to climb a ladder, which is winding, so you really don't know what's around the corner, but you must climb. Mm -hmm. And what you're climbing to is to face yourself at the end. So I think... This atonement with the father or the, the abyss is this moving into the unknown through the winding staircase. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of the, the threshold to the, uh, to the dark night of the soul where the, the hero has to really encounter all of the parts in themselves because they've been initiated into this new world. They've gotten a bunch of knowledge. They've met with the goddess. They're, they're very high on life in terms of this new experience that they're having. But I think this is the point at which they realize that there is a shadow side to everything, that they, they have to dive into the abyss of their own soul in order to come out on the other side. Well, and if you look at the word atonement, it means at one minute with the father. So if we take the father as the ego, instead of saying atonement, and we say at one minute with the ego, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, I've heard in a lot of philosophical discussions that we have to take the ego and we have to uproot it and kill it. And that's not really being at one with that, that authority figure in your life. You really need to look at it. I think it, masonry helps 
when you look at it saying, what about your ego is important and what needs to be put into check? Be at one with it, but don't be a slave to well, it. Well, I mean, why do you climb the winding staircase? Because you're going to receive your wages, but your your wages is, is based on what you've learned and what you've done. So in a, in a, fa- in a sense, like w- when you get to the top of the winding staircase, what you're doing is confronting your own work. And in a sense, you're confronting yourself. And the Father can be the own, your, your, the divinity within you. So mm-hmm. you're, you're really going to see, do you deserve everything that you've done? Do you think that's Luke on Dagobah when he looks into the mirror and sees himself? You know, that's not a mirror. That's the, um, he goes into the tree, oh, in a bad. cave within a tree. Mm-hmm. That's the abyss. The abyss, yeah. Yeah, and he faces his father, which is Darth Vader. So I think for the But Mason, when he looks at it, it's the, the it's helmet, really, it's, that's right. It's the helmet himself. breaks and it's his own face. So yeah. I think the same thing. We're going up this winding staircase to get our wages and what we're, what we're doing is we're facing the father well in most mythology this is really the point at which you you find out that the evil character of the story is in fact some way related to mm-hmm. or created the hero in the case it's you know luke finds out that darth vader is his father or uh neo and actually to your point brother matthias neo goes into a middle chamber and meets the architect of the matrix who is oh, yeah. who is his father right who is yeah. his creator and they they kind of this is the point at which the the, the hero realizes that everything he's fighting against also exists within himself. And that really to win the battle, he has to first fight the battle in his own heart before he can bring victory for all of the other people that he represents. Well, and the other thing too, if you look at it, is that um, when you have that atonement with the father, you're really looking at trying to level off your perspective of that. It's a kind of a grand leveler. It's like, are you really being fair with that authority figure in your life? You know, take it back to when we were children and you had that parent that really made you mad for whatever reason and you just thought they were tyrannical and then you become a parent yourself or you grow up and you're just like, nope, they were actually being very fair and equitable and I was just the one having the tantrum. And so there's this point where we have to recognize that when we go to receive our wages, that what we're given is is really what we're due. And the interesting thing about this too, um, just one final point on it, is that when you have an ego that is overfed, Campbell calls it improperly initiated. And what happens when you have something that's proper improperly initiated, it creates chaos. And it makes me think of those individuals that enter the ancient mysteries and the, the mystery schools and masonry, and they weren't ready. And what happened to them? They, they weren't ready for that co- confrontation, that experience with the goddess, the temptress, and then the father as an ogre. They, they're overwhelmed. And what happens to them? They don't understand the wages they're, they're given. They don't understand why they're given. And they, and they fall apart. So it, it's a very interesting and precarious place if it's not done rightly. And if it is done rightly, it brings the hero to the, to the next step of apotheosis, this um, basically means becoming God. I think in the original Greek, it means something like becoming God. But it's the point at which, so having faced the shadow, integrated it, not conquered it or defeated it or banished it, but integrated it into their own personality, they now have both their own new powers that they've been gathering, plus the power of this of this shadow element that they've integrated within themselves, which does contain useful things to their personality. They're now ready to take on the real challenge. And it, it's, it's interesting, like, you know, you, you kind of think that they've they've reached their own personal conclusion, like they've become who they were supposed to be. But really, that's just preparation for their greater work. It, just like in masonry, like when you take when you finish the second degree and you're ready to go to the third degree, like you've kind you've kind of become a more complete person. But that was really all in preparation for you to do something even greater mm-hmm. in the aid of the collective that you now represent. It's interesting. I always ask um, people going to the third degree when they're examined, take their catechism. Uh, I always ask them, uh, do you feel that you deserve and have earned the right to move forward? And, you know, sometimes they're like, absolutely. And I think that's the answer I'm looking for, frankly. Um, or sometimes they're like, no, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I don't think I'm ready uh, or I don't deserve it. And I'm like, well, then why are you taking this exam? Like, you have to have reached the stature of, of being fully a fellow craft, being fully empowered, and, and, and you're ready to move forward. If you don't think you're ready to move forward, why should I vote for you to move forward? Well, I've always found that to be interesting in the Masonic system that you really you, you don't become the degree when you take the degree. 
Like when you take the second degree, you're not a fellow craft. It's only when you're ready to take the next degree that you should have really yeah. become the degree that you're leaving now. That's your real moment of initiation. Mm-hmm. It's like, a, you know, it, the, the real initiations lag behind a degree. Like you're, you actually only become a fellow craft when you take the degree of Master Mason. If you're ready to take the degree. Exactly. Master, yeah. Master Mason. So the next step, which is the final step of initiation, is the ultimate boon. And I think this is the third degree. This is that moment that every every you know Mason's been waiting for, where uh, they go through that final trial and final victory over the greatest foe that any Mason, any human being, can face. And that person that goes through that, all their training in the first and second degree, all they've learned is to prepare them for that ultimate moment of of being steadfast of being resilient, of following in the footsteps of our Masonic ancestors. Really kind of like, um, what is the word for it? Uh, Consummating the entire Mm -hmm. Masonic education that they've received. Because, you know, all of this education, it's like Masonry is not a self-help program. It, it, It does do that, but for a greater purpose. And this is the moment where that greater purpose is revealed to you, where you actually have to do work with what you've with all these all these working tools that you've gathered around you, this is the time that they're put to the test. This is in the Lord of the Rings when the one ring is cast into Mount Doom and destroyed. This is the moment where the second Death Star is destroyed and the Emperor uh, is defeated in in the Return of the Jedi. And another great example is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which is the third installment of the Indiana Jones series, where. Um, uh, Indiana Jones gets the Holy Grail and mm-hmm. drinks from it. So I guess he's going to live forever, right? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this is the elixir of life. This is all the mythological uh, summations of esoteric quests. This is the pinnacle of the hero's journey. It's not the end of the hero's journey, but this is where finally the Philosopher's Stone is found and the the alchemists can continue on their journey. So... Uh, the, you know, Campbell goes into this in great detail in his book, but I think ultimately can be summed up is that this is your great reward. How hard you fought through the first two acts. Here's where, where it's at. You know, think of the hero's journey. It's two acts out of three. You know, you spend two thirds of your trying, time trying to get to this point. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, I wonder if this is what people would call enlightenment or nirvana or I, I don't know, but it's definitely a place where your reward is given. This is what you were ultimately trying to get to begin with. Another good example, this is a little more obscure, but it's the never-ending story, which you won't get this in the movie, but if you've read the book, which is very, very very good, good, better than the movie, and I love the movie, um, Sebastian has um, recreated Fantasia. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's given a name uh, to the the, the childlike empress empress and reignited all of Fantasia. But that's... Not the end of the book. That's the end of the movie, but that's not mm. the end that's of the, the book. That's the middle of the book. Yeah. yeah. And and the next stage after this great victory is, and we're entering the third act here, is the return. And the first part of the return is the refusal of the return. So this is the point at which the hero has is kind of like basking in his own glory and, and doesn't want to commit to the rest of the story, really. Because like you said, like this is, you know, he's just reached the pinnacle well, why go down from the highest peak back into the lowest valley from which he started? You know, you know, they want to enjoy a little bit of time on the highest peak, but that's not what the story demands. And that's not really what life demands of us. Whenever we, you know, attain one victory, it's not so that we can sit there and remember it for the rest of our lives. It's so that we can go on and do something else, so that we can return back to the world from which we came. This is the point in a lot of stories where, you know, heroes remember that they had families and friends and there was a whole other world that like kind of depended, that was the reason for them to go back. Yeah, they're like, I don't want to be They're basking in their victory. Well, I think they're also tired. I mean, it's not just this like, oh, I'm so great and wonderful. It's like, man, I fought a hard fight. I'm I'm tired. I want to stay here. This is the top of Jacob's Ladder. Mm-hmm. You know, the, like, man, I don't want to go back down. But this is also the Bodhisattva vow. Yep. Which, Brother Axel, I know you love that one. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the Bodhisattva vow? Well, so the Bodhisattva vow is an idea in Buddhism that um, basically, like, when you reach the threshold of nirvana, you're offered two choices. Um, one is to enter into nirvana and you know experience glorious bliss until everybody else has also reached nirvana and then you can all move on together. 
The second choice is to take the Bodhisattva vow and to return back to the material plane until and to assist in the evolution of all other forms of life until everybody can enter into nirvana. So you're given the chance to, you know, enter this great waiting room or to go back and experience pain and suffering and temptation and trial in order to work, you know, for the for the furthering of, of the goal. But I think it's really it's the final test. Like I, it really is like I think whether like taking the bodhisattva vow is the final trial of the heroes like whether or not you're you're willing to go back and do this whole thing again for everybody else or if you were just in it for yourself the whole time it's like it's like the great architects like did you really earn that ultimate boon are you willing to go back if you say yes you're willing to go back then yes you earned it Mm -hmm. but if you're gonna sit there and bask in foreverness of your great you know achievement then you really didn't deserve it and this to me is where i look at masons who've been in the craft for decades and it's like man they they chose to hang around so that my sorry butt could be educated in masonry and and have a masonic life like they came back to help me and that's really where i think masonry is at it's not about the titles and the degrees and the positions in office it's really about once you get to the top of the ladder you know uh, metaphorically speaking are you going to turn around and put your hand down so someone else can climb up next to you or you're going to put your foot on their head and not let them pass. You know, that to me, this is really where the masonry takes place. Are you willing to help your younger brothers and be patient with them and come back into the profane world and really start where the where the education should begin? Or, and I agree with you guys, or it's where the hero is tired. Like they've done this great work and they're like, look, I did what I had to do and I'm done. Like this is, you know, they're going to retirement at this mm-hmm. point, you know, like, um, they don't want to go back to the ordinary world. They they just kind of want to be left alone, you know. And I, there's a good example, which is, you know, after the ring is thrown in, Frodo is completely exhausted, you know. And but he's got to go back to Hobbiton, but he doesn't want to, you know. Well, and it goes into the next part of the magic flight, which is the next step here in this final act, where. You know, once you say, yes, I'm going to take the Bodhisattva vow, I'm going to, I'm going to do my Masonic duty, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be a part of the evolution of my brothers and sisters. Now you have to leave with what you achieved, which people are going to chase after you. So the magic flight is where you have to escape with your reward, but you are going to delay people so they don't catch you. An example of this in a, in a modern fairy tale would be Cinderella. She leaves her shoe behind. Um, to delay people from finding her so she can run off with her reward of having the evening with the prince. And so you have this magic flight, which is now that dissension down Jacob's ladder. So this brings us to the step of rescue from without, which might not always take the form of a rescue. It's, it's the point at which the world kind of calls the attention of the hero again. It's the point where they decide they must return. You know, maybe they refuse the call to begin with and they spend a little bit more time in, in this kind of magical world and basking in their own victory. But this is the point at which the world decides that they need the hero. It, it kind of like moves them beyond their own self-direction and reasserts the necessity of duty in the hero's life. Well, I think in the raising ceremony of Master Mason, this is that point where the 15 fellows of the craft uh, go on their important mission. This, this is not the hero, but this is the friends of the hero mm-hmm. going out to perform a rescue, to seek him out, to, to do their deed, uh, to, to come from without to within. Well, I think this is also a very interesting point because this is the Campbell says, you know, society is jealous of those who remain away from it. And I always thought that was an interesting idea for the hero. Like, I don't think we can stay out outside in this dreamscape and away from the profane world. Like as we're doing all this interior work, which to me, this is what the hero's journey represents. We have to still be in the profane world. We can't escape it. And so when we get lost in our own thoughts, in our own mind, when we just live, you know, kind of with a tunnel vision, society is always there to say, no, we have to rescue from that. Because what happens when you start to just have that tunnel vision? You you start losing sight of everything else. This well, could also be the, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to say this, this could only, this could also be the point in either a story or one's own life where, where the hero or yourself recognizes that you're not alone that there is help that there are other people that have undergone mm-hmm. what you've just mm-hmm. undergone and that you have a friend that can come to your aid in, in your most trying times um so i think that this is the point at which 
the hero kind of joins a band of heroes and, and, and kind of furthers the story by adding themselves to the ranks of a greater movement. Like each, each step kind of opens up an exponentially greater um, layer of what the hero is undergoing throughout the journey. That leads us to the next point, which is the crossing of the return threshold. So, you know, back in the first act, um, we had to cross a threshold, but now you're returning back to where you started. And so you have to kind of cross that threshold from the opposite side. This is a really important point. And I think this is really well illustrated in the Lord of the Rings, particularly um, it's not in the movie, but it's in the book where after the one ring has been destroyed, uh, the hobbits by themselves return back to Hobbiton and find that Sauron has uh, conquered Hobbiton and enslaved all the hobbits. And so the hobbits, without Aragon, without, without Legolas. Gander, Legolas and all their buddies, they then by themselves, with everything they've learned on their 13-month journey, have to defeat Sauron. And they do that. And they restore victory to, um, to, to Hobbiton. They, re- they restore it from a place of slavery into a beautiful place. It's green and they're all you know, drinking ale and you know, smoking pipe weed and all that. But it's almost like everything they've learned, they have to do it now. But they don't get any aid. There's no mentors. Mm-hmm. They, are the, aid. they, they, they are the they aid. are the they are the aid of the enslaved hobbits. They are the the hero now becomes the supernatural aid of the regular world. They kind of they they evolve into their next um, you know state of being that they have to go back and help those that are going to come along on the same journey that they have just completed. They are now the mentor. And Campbell says in this section of um, the book, he says the boon brought from the transcendent deep becomes quickly rationalized into non-entity, and the need becomes great for another hero to refresh the word. How teach again, however, what has been taught correctly and incorrectly learned a thousand times throughout the millennia of mankind's prudent folly. That is the ultimate uh, difficulty for the hero. So it's this idea that this new hero coming back into the profane world has to refresh the word. He has to teach it correctly just for the people behind him to learn it incorrectly. And this comes full circle back to Freemasonry. So this is something that I think any Mason will recognize. So people become Master Masons. What do they do? Uh, I'm done with the Blue Lodge. I'm going to go become a Shriner. I'm going to go to the Scottish Shrine. I'm done with this. I've mastered it. And what they're doing is failing at this point. Now, what you do after you've become a Master Mason is that now you must instruct others as you were instructed. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, you actually never became a master mason you're a fraud it's a deception you went through motions you took obligations you said you'd become a master mason but a master mason is a teacher to fellow crafts and apprentices if you don't teach your your skill your trade to those below you you're not really a master mason a master mason means you you are teaching people a craft and if you don't do that i think you're a fraud well the other thing too is that this part of the hero's journey this dissension, you know, ascension, descension, is that he has to bring together, he has to tie together that world he came from and the world he lives in now. Like Frodo Baggins has to tie together Hobbiton and that reality. Once, you know, he's forever changed by throwing the ring into Mount, um, Mount Doom. And now he comes back to Hobbiton. He has to, you know, he says, how do you put together your life that has changed so drastically? And I'm paraphrasing. He has to find a way to bring him into to put one together, reality. I think to put a life together of broken pieces. And that's that's the job of the Master Mason. That's the job of the hero is to how do you bring what you know from the transcendent and deep and bring it into the material where all people care about is their senses and their sensual pleasures. Well, and that's, that's a great segue into this second to last step uh, in Campbell's model, which is the master of two worlds. It's... This is the part where the hero learns to do just that, where they they realize after all of these great victories, these great experiences, their losses that they've had, they now have to like put all of this together. You know, in living it, it seemed very natural to proceed from one experience to the next, but now they're they're kind of at a point of repose, like looking back and considering all of this, and and really struggling with the with the question, who am I now? What has this done to me? What has this created in me? What, what am I? I'm, I'm not the person that started this journey. So at the end of it now, what am I? 
And I think that's a point that I think everybody struggles with when they come to the completion of a cycle in their life or, you know, a cycle in masonry. Like like you said, Brother Matthias, at the end of your journey through the Blue Lodge, if you don't have that moment of contemplation, if you don't reflect on what you've done and and kind of look back like the Bodhisattva to to help other people with the glory that you have just experienced, then did you really get it the whole time? No, you never got it. You're a charlatan, mm-hmm. you know? You're a burden. You're a burden. I think that's a great way of putting it. I think being the master of two worlds is taking the one world is everything you went through mm-hmm. and then returning to your old world. And now there's something. a synthesis between mm-hmm. these two worlds. And that allows you to guide others through the threshold, through the road of trials, to go through the various phases of the hero's journey. Because again, you know, Frodo without Gandalf would have failed. Uh, Luke Skywalker without um, Obi-Wan Kenobi would have failed. Harry without Dumbledore. And 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 uh, Neo with Morpheus, they mm-hmm. all would have failed. There mm-hmm. has to be a mentor, and so if each of us doesn't become a mentor, then well, then, then why another, do we even do yeah. this? Why another do we another bridge mentions? gets burned. Right? Well, yeah. and the other thing too, there's two points I want to make to what was said is that we don't get to choose what type of mentor we are. Mm-hmm. We aren't the, the great loving Gandalf that's like you know this wonderful human being. Sometimes we're the ogre, and it's not that we we intentionally try to be that, but a brother may see us and say, "Man, that per like." They just represent everything I don't like for whatever reason. It's not that you're a horrible person. Mm -hmm. It's just that what they see in you is not what, it's what they need and maybe not what you are. And so when you come back as a master, you have to be willing to take on the role that that brother needs you to be. And it's going to shift and it's going to change. And what I like about in um, The Hero of a Thousand Faces, what Campbell says in this part, he says, for the hero, flesh had dissolved before their eyes to reveal the word. And when we really play that part that we're supposed to, it doesn't matter what flesh we wear. Because we're always holding the word within us. And we're always trying to have the brother get a glimpse of that. Mm-hmm. We are now part of the word. And finally, we arrive at the freedom to live. This is step 17. This is the end of the hero's journey. And really this step should be something that every Master Mason truly understands, which is in order to really live, you must overcome the fear of death. If, you are, if you're paralyzed by death, and everybody is at some point. You know, I meet people all the time, they're like, oh, I'm not really scared of dying. Mm-hmm. They're full of crap, in my opinion. No, we are all scared to die. That's why we do the things that we do in our lives, because we're trying to enjoy it as much as we can. We're trying to get as much out of it as we can before we die. We try to prolong it with exercise, good eating. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this, but ultimately we will die. There is no stopping death. And only the person that doesn't fear that death, whether it comes tomorrow, the next day, can live today properly because they're not thinking about that moment. They're not doing things today to prevent that moment tomorrow. And then you can live today to do things that are real. Mm -hmm. And that is a Master Mason. That is a Jedi Knight. That is someone that has mastered the moment, lives in the moment, has achieved some level of enlightenment, and can take everything they've learned and make a better world. Well, and that's the only real sense of freedom that there can possibly be. If there, if there is this one kind of like, you know, abject thing in your life that's awaiting you at your final day that you're, you're continuing to avert your gaze from, then there really is no freedom, right? You haven't banished Saruman from hobbiton you haven't really you know won your victory over the machines if you're neo you haven't really vanquished all of the evil in your life and there will always be that kind of persistent haunting thought that I, there's there's something that i left undone mm-hmm. and so really the only way to kind of achieve the victory over the grave is to become the the true hero and help other heroes reach the the pinnacle of their own journeys so by by doing that you you actually perpetuate yourself into eternity, like a, a piece of you will live in a piece of them as they go through time. So when you do encounter death, you're still with them. Just like, uh, you know, Vader is still with Luke at the end of the Return of the Jedi as, you know, a spirit in the Force because he overcame himself in throwing away the darkest parts of him represented by the Emperor. Well, if you look at the freedom to live, it's also the fact that you have gone through a one hell of a ride and you've experienced terrible things and you've had to... Look, as you said, that dark night of the soul and really evaluate yourself. And once you've really done that, like truly done that, then you are free to live because you're like, what's going to hurt me? What? You're going to take my life away? Okay. Take it. What are you going to do? You're going to take my material possessions away? 
I don't need them. Like there's this detachment that's not a bad detachment. It's just you realize that you are enough and you can live just as you are in complete freedom without the, the constraints of society and what society thinks you need to be a happy human being. So I think that's probably to me is the ultimate boon is the freedom to live. That you are free to live as you are, as a divine spark. You can help those behind you, those who want your help, because not everyone wants your help. And that you're willing to take on the roles that you need to take on for those brothers so that they can have this ultimate gift, which is the freedom to truly live. Ultimately, in Freemasonry, for those of you listening that that may have not uh, become members yet, and hopefully will be, the ultimate goal is freedom. It's freedom. And how do we obtain that freedom? Well, we have to go through many trials because there's this idea that we are free at birth. But that can't be possible because we're indoctrinated. Uh, We're conditioned by our parents, by our religion, by our society. And so the hero's journey is a way to escape all that enslaves us, all those things that bind us to our creators, and to truly set us free so that we can make our own destiny. This, I believe is the goal of masonry and so any of you that wish to seek this freedom masonry will give you the path it will provide you the mentors it will provide you the trials and the thresholds by which to gain this victory but first you have to answer the call thank you for listening to legends of the craft this podcast is purely the opinion of brothers matthias comcier and axel suvari does not represent the official views of Universal Co-Masonry. Universal Co-Masonry is a Masonic order founded on the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity that admits men and women without distinction of race, religion, or creed. For more information, please visit universalfreemasonry.org.